you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 23, a familiar passage and a favorite to many. You know, a while back, I read about a Benedictine monastery in New Mexico called Christ in the Desert. At the monastery, there is a path that leads from the chapel to the dining hall. And that path leads directly through the cemetery. And all who pass through on that path pass by an open grave. On one occasion, a guest asked, Oh, did one of the brothers just die? And the response came back, No, that's for the next one. <laughs> so three times a day, on their way from praying together to eating together, the monks pass by an open grave and are reminded that one of them will be the next one. Such an acknowledgement stands in stark contrast to the widespread denial of death that permeates our American culture and can at times even infuse the church. Despite how frequently we hear of death, how regularly we are touched by death, and how inevitably all of us will face death, we don't talk much about death. In fact, sometimes we try just about everything to avoid even thinking about it. Despite our typical human avoidance of the topic of death, it's actually given a lot of attention in Scripture. In fact, death is portrayed as the natural conclusion of every human life. Scripture even states there is a time to be born and a time to die. The deaths of countless people are recorded in the pages of Scripture. Death caused by wars and battles, by famine and disease, or simply by old age. Referenced in the Bible were the deaths of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Significant leaders like Moses, all the Israelite kings, including David, and some of the earliest followers of Jesus. Even Jesus himself went through the very human experience of death. On the TV sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond, Ray was having a midlife crisis. And his mom identified it as a fear of dying. So she didn't want the topic discussed. Well, his father, Frank, in his own typically blunt way said, what am I supposed to tell him? That it's not going to happen? It's going to happen. Then he looked directly at Raymond and said, you're going to die. <laughs> he didn't try to deny or avoid the reality of death. He confronted him with it. But the question comes, how can we face such a grim reality? How can we face death at all, or even do so with confidence? Well, this morning we look again at the example of David. As we conclude our study of David, facing the stuff of life with eyes of faith, we look at his words as recorded in Psalm 23, where he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now many psalms are attributed to David. And many of them depict his struggles of dealing with the stuff of life. 
But this well-known and much-beloved psalm is a psalm of trust. It's a psalm of confidence. And it illustrates that confidence for life's end is found in who God is. You see, verse 1 begins with this beautiful confession. The Lord is my shepherd. The image of the shepherd brings to mind the fullness of God's care. It's a vivid and comprehensive metaphor because the shepherd is everything to the flock. Provider, leader, and protector. And indeed, as our shepherd, God provides. Wonderful, wonderful image in verses 1 and 2 when it says, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. The lying down near green pastures and quiet waters provides the image of tranquility and rest in a world of chaos of turmoil, of uncertainty and danger, God provides the opportunity for renewing and restoring rest. The green pastures and still waters are also images of refreshment and nourishment to strengthen us and equip us for the continuing journey of life. In a world that saps our strength, drains our energy, and depletes our vitality. God provides that which will renew our bodies and restore our souls. And the shepherd, God leads. In verse 3 it says, He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The path upon which God leads is one of righteousness. And that term has moral implications, leading us to the way that is good, right, and beneficial for us and for those around us. See, the straight or righteous path is not always the easiest. It may at times be dark, dangerous, or lonely. But God guides us in paths of righteousness, and he does so for his name's sake. Now think about that for a moment. God's reputation and honor are at stake. Because as the shepherd, God is responsible for the welfare of his sheep. As a result, God will not be untrue to his vocation as shepherd or to the sheep under his care. God leads in paths of righteousness. And as our shepherd, God protects Verse 4, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In this world of threats, dangers, uncertainty, and vulnerability, God defends. You see, for the shepherd, the rod and the staff were not instruments of coercion, or threat. They were instruments of protection, of help and reassurance. Most of the times when we see people holding a stick, it, it, it's an image of intimidation or danger. But with the image of the shepherd, the rod and the staff were used to fend off threats, to lift the sheep out of danger, or to gently nudge in an effort to extend tender reminders of his presence in the darkest of moments. That's the image of God as shepherd, with his rod and his staff protecting, helping, and reassuring. We need God's protection, and we desperately need those reminders of his presence. We need to see signs of God's assistance, be able to hear God's familiar voice, have the reassurance that God is with us in those darkest of moments in life. And that's what God does. He offers those reminders through the support and prayers of the people around us, through the promises of His Word as we read it and it speaks to us in our hearts and our situation. 
when the darkness comes, God gently nudges with the staff, reassuringly reminding his sheep of his constant and protective presence. You see, the psalm radiates confidence in God's goodness, in God's provision, in God's protection because of God's unchanging love. Because the writer knew God as his shepherd, he had everything he needed. He was confident for the future, whatever it might hold. Confidence for life's end is found in who God is. But confidence for life's end grows when we walk with God in faith. We've got to discover more and more who God is and how dependable he is. So the love of this psalm stems primarily from the intensely personal portrayal of the writer's relationship with God. David knew the Lord as his shepherd. And how did he know God in that way, in that personal, intimate way? It's because he walked with God in faith. As a result, this psalm is a confession. It's a statement of confidence and trust. And such faith leads us to depend upon God's provision, to acknowledge that we're creatures of need, weakness, and weariness. We are like sheep. And David definitely knew times of need as we work through some of his story. We know he faced down enemies. He felt the burden of leadership. He experienced injustice at the hands of others. He bore the guilt and consequences of his own sin and failures. He even endured the betrayal of his own son. David regularly found himself in need of God's renewing strength and provision. And as we go through life, we too need restoration of energy restoration of strength we need the renewal and refreshment that comes only from God you know we tend to pride ourselves in our strength we tend to pride ourselves in our own self-sufficiency and in our drive to do it ourselves we tend to lose the power to slow down and relax So God most mercifully compels those who will listen to him to lie down. (laughs) Lie down in green pastures and rest beside still waters. To pause for worship, to take time for rest, is a picture of our trusting dependence on God, to whom we relinquish control and in whom we trust to provide and restore our souls. Faith leads us to look to God, depend upon God, and experience God's renewing provision. And faith also leads us to follow God's leading. Just as our journey is characterized by need, it's also characterized by decision. And faith leads us to listen for God's voice. You know, in biblical times, sheep would learn to discern the shepherd's voice to recognize and to verify his tone so that they could separate themselves from the other in following their particular shepherd. In the same way, only as we learn to discern God's voice can we move forward with confidence. But having heard and learned to discern the voice of God, faith leads us to respond with obedience, to walk after him, to follow in his steps. And boy, what a wonderful example we have in David. One who sought the Lord, one who listened for God's voice, one who followed God's leading. Imperfectly at times, but then he got back on track and continued to look to and listen for the Lord. David followed God in faith and found God to be completely faithful in leading him in paths of righteousness. And faith leads us to trust God's protection. This life brings with it not only times of need and decision, but times of threat and danger as well. The possibility of fear and uncertainty can distract or discourage us. The possibility of being overwhelmed with the stuff of life is very real. David in this passage, in fact, mentioned the valley of the shadow 
of death. That's any dark and gloomy experience through which we may pass, that we can't see the other side. And this is often just as much a part of the paths of righteousness as the green pastures and still waters. The dark valleys are a part of everyone's journey to some degree. David, a man after God's own heart, had his share of dark valleys. Even Jesus had dark valleys. And those dark valleys are full of dangers and threats and uncertainty. And the temptation to fear, doubt, and rebellion. And yet here David writes, I will fear no evil. Why? I mean, why when it's so dark? Why, why when it's so hard and he can't see? Because he's able to confess, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, faith enables us to move forward in the darkness without being able to see all that lies ahead, knowing that God does. God knows the way. God can see us through. And God is good enough to guide us and strong enough to protect us from all that might lurk in the valley of the shadow of death. You see, that's what David discovered. God had remained with him at all times even in the darkest of valleys. In those times, the shepherd was no longer ahead to lead, but he was right along beside to reassure, never leaving or forsaking whatever came along. Verse 5 provides another picture of God's provision and protection when he writes, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup, overflows. Notice this psalm. In a world of darkness where enemies and evil exist, in a world that threatens to beat us down, wound us, and rob us of life, God provides such safety, refreshment, and healing that no point of hospitality is neglected. Our cup overflows. Listening Receiving, trusting, following. That's our part. It's the means by which our confidence in God grows as we walk with Him in faith. And it's in walking with God that we increasingly discover what God can do. And it's in walking with God that verse 6 can be confidently affirmed. He concludes this psalm by writing, Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word certainly or surely expresses a conviction based upon his experience of God and his trust in God's consistency. God's goodness and faithful loving kindness will pursue him all the days of his life. More dark days may come, but the goodness and mercy of God are experienced even in the midst of them, and those good purposes will pursue him until the day he reaches his final destination where he will be forever. And the psalm, with all the ups and downs of green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys, ends on a note of permanency reminding us that those who have walked with God in life can be sure of God's faithfulness, which gives confidence for the next. You know, the greatness of this psalm is found in the trust exhibited through a very realistic lens. The psalm does not attempt to deny or gloss over dark valleys or enemies or the presence of evil or even the issue of death. But it's a psalm of faith because through it all, it discerns and depends upon the presence of the Good Shepherd who is merciful to provide and powerful to protect. You know, when I read this psalm, I imagine David writing this psalm in his old age after he had experienced all the stuff of life. 
danger, injustice, heartbreak, loss, grief, and guilt. But David also knew the joy, peace, and provision of God who brought him through the stuff of life with much grace, with many successes, with countless victories, and an enduring promise. He had the green pastures and still waters. He also had the valley of the shadow of death. He had the banquet table prepared. He also had the enemies in his presence. But through it all, his cup ran over. In the midst of it all, whatever the outward circumstances of his life, one constant remained. The Lord was his shepherd, guiding, providing, and protecting in all the stuff of this life in preparation for the next. His experience of God's faithfulness brought hope for the future and confidence for life's end. You know, the trust demonstrated in this psalm is not a rosy, romantic, overly optimistic view of life in this world. It's a faith demonstrated in a world where strength must be found, decisions must be made, where harm and evil threaten, and where darkness and death exist. But it is a faith rooted in who God is, and it grows by walking in dependence and obedience to God. So this morning, I wonder, do you have that kind of relationship with the Lord? Do you, in a personal way, know the Lord as your shepherd, your provider, your leader and guide, your protector? Is it the most natural thing in the world for you to go to him, to follow after him, to attach yourself to him in dependence and trust? Do you have confidence for life's end? Because just like Frank in his eloquency told Raymond, you're going to (laughs) die. Are you ready? Do you have confidence when that time comes? comes. You see, confidence for life's end has nothing to do with who we are, nothing to do with what we've done. It has everything to do with who we follow, what He provides, what He's promised. So this morning, have you entrusted yourself to the one who provides, who guides, who protects in this life and in the next? Have you entrusted yourself to the good shepherd? Perhaps you hear this morning and God is tugging on your heart to respond for the first time to say, God, I I don't have that confidence. I want to have it. And I know it, it doesn't come from me or anything in this world. It comes only from you and what you've done on my behalf. And maybe God is leading you to put your trust in him for the first time. To say, God, I need that. I need that that's beyond me. A need that comes only from you. Or perhaps you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ. Well, the question for us is, are we walking daily in this kind of relationship, depending upon God's provision, depending on God's guidance, trusting in his protection? Are we trying to do it on our own, make our own way? Maybe this morning as a believer, God is calling you back to this very personal, individual relationship with him that says, God, I've drifted away. I haven't been following you in faith. I want to walk with you daily. I want to know you more deeply. God, I want to know you as my shepherd, the way David knew you. In a world where darkness, evil, and enemies exist, Are you trusting and following the good shepherd? Or perhaps you're here this morning and you're a person of faith, but you know you've gotten off the path of righteousness. You've begun to do things on your own in self-sufficient independence. Perhaps this morning God is leading you to return to him in a relationship depicted here 
a relationship that walks with, follows after, and depends upon the Lord as your shepherd. Or perhaps you're here this morning and God has lead you to this church body, a place to belong, a place to grow in faith, a place to nurture and restore in a world that depletes and drains. However, God may be leading you to respond this morning. Cindy's going to be here and lead us in our hymn of invitation. Keith and I will be down here at the front. If you have a, a personal prayer or personal decision you'd like to make public, respond to Christ, respond to his call, respond to what he's done and the relationship that he offers as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation without him, hymn number 300. Would you stand together as we sing?